examples of misconducts. Né? Actually, a lot more than this, because they are also um, outlined in the student disciplinary code. Say maybe if one student harasses another or assaults another, threatens any sort of threatening behavior, should one student complain to us that a certain student was actually threatening them, and in that there's proof of such uh, misconduct, in that our office will intervene. Sexual harassment, if maybe there's another student who has uh, sexually, uh, sexually uh, committed the misconduct to another, or maybe if there was a lecturer who who did that to the student, our wow. office comes in in that regard. Plagiarism, we know with this one, uh, the university has been under a lot of scrutiny lately on the media and everything. Now, uh, should we find that you used fraudulent qualification to gain an advantage to the university? We will subject you to a formal hearing. Any examination of irregularities, you might uh, ask yourself, how, how is this going to be detected? Because now we are in, we are no longer in venue based, but rather in online. Remember now, if uh, the the test or exam is a closed book, and you are invigilated, and then as you uh, the invigilator is speaking to you, to now it's your turn to take pictures and whatnot. Should you be found in position of those notes, then that itself is a misconduct because you are not adhering to the rules of the university. Post writing or making use of external services providers. In this one, we know that um, most of our students are, are working. You know, sometimes you are exhausted when you get home or whatnot. And then maybe you feel like you need to opt for someone uh, for outside services, service providers, or someone to write for you. You cannot get someone to write for you. That is against the university rules. Now, making use of external service providers. Uh, you may do so. It's not advisable. But if you feel like you need to better understand the subject, but also remember, you need to come back to the university's um, way of teaching and see if it it is aligned. Because if it's not allowing, aligned, it's 300 of you who's, who's making use of the service providers and they are teaching you something that is not in line with the university. So if maybe when you feel like you need to use this, always go back to how the lecturer is structuring his, uh, his or her way of teaching. Fraudulent. Fraudulent um, is this, uh, well, in our office, mostly we have uh, found students who have purchased papers. That's actually a fraud in terms of trying to deceive the marker or someone within the university to say that is your work by committing fraud. So in that, you'll be referred to our office for disciplinary. Now, processes and procedures. What happens in, in a hearing? In a hearing, when we invite you, we send you as a student the notice, the notice detailing the date and the charges that we are bringing to you. On that, we also include the evidence that is submitted to our office. And then, um, yes, and then now, when we invite you, you come there, there's an ad, ad hoc committee. What's an ad hoc committee? Is that an ad hoc committee is that there's a chairperson and there are two or three members of the committee. And then they will, that is a, as an ad hoc committee, they will deliberate over your matter. Remember, it's going to be you who's invited. It's going to be your lecturer or whoever it is that uh, sent this matter to our office. And they will delegate over such matter. Now, uh, when uh, the, 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 the sanction comes, the, system, the sanction is determined on how you present your case. Sanctions can be, say, they suspend you from the university for five years. I know for fraudulent activities, they suspend students for five years. Or if maybe it's plagiarism, they can suspend you for a year, depending on how you argue your case, a year, two years, and above. Now, say you are convincing enough 
that the committee is believing that maybe you have knowledge of the subject or maybe you have made an error somewhere, somewhere, but you have knowledge of the subject. You know, you understand the subject. They can pardon you. In them pardoning you, they can say, okay, we'll give you a warning letter with a chance to re-register the module. Or they can say, no, we, we pardon you and your marks will be released, depending on how your case is structured and how you argue your case. Now, uh, the challenges with online. The online, we know that ever since the pandemic, it has pushed, well, accelerated everything online and that um, we were forced to transition very fast and we were forced to adapt. Hence, most students, they uh, opt for these service providers. And remember now, with service providers now, you actually, um, what, contravening the PAPIA Act on yourself. Because now, if you give someone else your student number or your credentials, you tell them to write this exam for you and whatnot, that on its own, the PAPIA protection falls away because you violated it from the start. So we no longer consider that. Now, like I said, evidence, evidence, evidence. Say now it's it's a, it's a take home exam. It's a portfolio exam. We know that with portfolios, uh, most lecturers they opt for a turn it in report. Should a turn it in report it be submitted to our office and it's found that you used AI? I know now these days, guys. Let me tell you this: we know all these um, avenues that you go to Stuvia, Studio, Studio.com, Give Me Notes, Telegram. We know them all. Chat GPT, Nova. We know them. As much as you guys are students, we are students ourselves. So in that, uh, the tuned in can detect the 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 the, the, you know, the AI, and if whether you went to um, the internet and you just took bits and pieces, that's called patch writing. It's also plagiarism, or maybe you say no, guys. Um, the, the Turnitin can't detect, you can write two words and the third word you change, two words and the third word you change. Turn it in, guys, detects that as well. What you just, just put in the work. You said you wanted the qualification, right? Put in the work, because I promise you every trick you can think of, we have way of circumventing that. Every trick, like I said, as much as you guys are students, we are students ourselves. So, um now the prevention like it's you know, we say that unisai has a, a zero tolerance towards plagiarism uh we have created partnership with uh well now we're working hand in hand with the src in trying to raise awareness and the um, library as well and then uh in that we're trying to um give away as much information as possible i see everybody went quiet when we <laughs> when i mentioned the ais and all the ways that you know that you guys think that you can circumvent or try to so please just listen just listen just do the work do the work and hard work pays off guys it does because now if you say that um you're gonna you're gonna cheat the system and at the end of the day you say you want to publish what kind of books are you going to publish if you don't know how to paraphrase, you don't know how to cite references properly, that your book will not, will never, ever be published. So, yeah, just adhere to the rules of the university. I, I think other other speakers will talk on how to avoid plagiarism. Um, I actually had a module that I needed to submit a short paragraph in a form. Um, and in this paragraph, I typed it myself, but for fun, I checked through some of the responses and my own and actually gave it into a AI checker to make sure if it's seeing it as written by an AI. And I was flagged for 80 percent. And this was something that I typed myself. Um, yes, it was this a research model? Uh, no, it was just a we were supposed to give feedback based on something that we read from a um, lecturer and we needed to give an opinion. Oh, okay, now see, they say you need to give an opinion. Whether you, when the lecturer maybe is directing you to the certain source, they're not saying take that thing verbatim. They're not saying, mm -hmm. um, they're not saying what, summarize. No, they're saying understand that module, understand that topic, then put it in your own words. There's paraphrasing. 
Paraphrasing is mean that taking someone else's words and take and putting them into your own understanding. Remember now that that's why there's paraphrasing so that now, it, like I said, if maybe you want to publish something, you know that this is what the the author was um was heading on, and in that I can expand further to say, okay, the author was saying that maybe light light is something that brings a uh, clarity to people and whatnot. If that is the topic itself, you need to expand that as to say the author is saying one, two, three, four, one, two, according to your own understanding. That's how you paraphrase according to your own understanding. Sorry, I think there was a bit of a miscommunication between us. That's what I was saying. I used my own words completely. I explained it in the manner that I saw and gave my opinion fully I was the only one that was typing. I didn't have an AI to reference from, and it, I was still oh. flagged to up to eighty percent. Did you? Did you? Uh, did you insert footnotes? Did you? Um, oh. Yes, because now remember when you paraphrase, you can you can uh, when you uh, um, uh, paraphrasing in your own words, you also need to insert footnotes to say, okay, fine, this is what. Um, the topic is about and in that this is how i'm paraphrasing in my paraphrasing yes i may take maybe one or two words love, from love, that love. and i will expand it on my words but even those one two words you need to put footnotes so that they know when the ai is generating it clears you on that that you cite the proper you cited the proper um uh what author you footnote it, and then you, in the bibliography, you included it. You understand? In that, the the, the similarity, the the index wouldn't have been that high. You do don't forget to 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 put in your footnotes as well in your work. I'm I'm not too sure if I understand you because uh, the previous gentleman just indicated that he wrote something according to his own understandings. And when you mention an issue of footnoting and writing the original writers, uh, or maybe uh, citing that, how does mm. that become? Because uh, uh, he wrote in his own words, and the AI for some reason flagged him as you know uh, having uh, having a certain percentage of plagiarism. How do we then footnote that? I'm not too sure if I'm the only one who no, even understands that. Okay, okay. Now let me ask you. I think uh, there was some misconception. What kind of AI are you using? You understand? Because now, if you say write your own words, you footnotes pro properly, you cite sources properly, you bibliograph properly. When you put it through, turn it in. I promise you, the percentile is not going to be as much as as the eighty percent one. That's what I'm saying. What what kind of AI? Read there are different AIs. Okay, so the I know the yes, the recognized tool of um the one uh, that Junisa uses. It's turn it in. What kind of AI did you put your work in? Okay, so just to give you an understanding, that the lecturer gave us a question to answer. Mm -hmm. um, and we answered the question, and then I took my answer that I gave and mm -hmm. put it through an AI detector um, just to see what would be the percentage, because I know the answer that I written was Your own. based okay. on everything that I just read. OK, one. Well, uh, remember now with your assessments, guys, I think you have three attempts. I'll confirm that with Erica. You have three attempts. When you submit it, Apparently, there's a generated and automated response to you as a student to say this is the similarity index. You need to fix one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Right now, from that report, that's when you have another chance to go back to your work, and then you fix it according to the report that was given to you by the system, and then you submit it. And should the report come up high again, then you can consult the lecturer. Lecturer. I am trying one, two, three, four. I'm trying one, two, three, four on, with all my best, and I'm citing sources. I'm doing one, two, three, four. What is it? Can I find? Can I kindly have guidance as to how is it that I must structure this one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, so that my tenant in index can be low? So I don't know which tool did you did you put your work through? Because you need to put it through turn it in, and then the turn it in it will generate. You see, on the group chat, be very careful because you all um 
putting in your, your thoughts and your ideas. Yes, as much as that that group chat is just sharing thoughts, be careful because now if you're sharing your own understanding and your own thought, another one's understanding was less than yours. And then they might take your answers or rather your understanding of which one are you going to put in your own um, answers. They might put that same thing. Be, be very, very careful as to how you share your information. You can share as minimum as possible. <clears throat> Yes, because in paraphrasing, no two minds can be the same. I can think of something else. You can think of some something that's more advanced than my answer. And when you share it with me on the group chat, obviously I'm going to say, okay, no, this one is like going to get an 80% according to the understanding. Obviously, I'm going to want the 80% as well. So I'm going to take that. Um, yes. I use Jimmy Notes to study. Uh, I don't buy papers from them because they have old papers from say 2001 and 2003 on their site. I use that to prepare for exams. Is that seen as being um, unethical? You can, you can check how the answers are structured. Ne? But remember, with each and every year, the, the questions, they change. So yeah. even you can, you can just Maybe if you use those past, you can check how they structure their answers, but you cannot yeah. say, okay, from that answer to which answer. You need just the structure on its own, yes. But then now comes the different question. You need to but, but I mean, answer like, it. Some, some of the things are multiple choice. So, so you do a, like a, this. Mu thing, multiple choice. Own, and, uh, own, own, yes. Uh, exam papers that you work through for, for preparation, yes. you understand? Yes. Now, listen. So now, okay. remember multiple choice ne? you can see that this is the same uh question but then now because there's a new curriculum that was added there's a new book that adds maybe on the previous it only had four four uh, answers now on this new curriculum it has five answers only to find out the fifth answer is different from that one you understand the, the 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 dynamics of it. The questions yeah. must be the same, but then the curriculum, the books, they changed. We know that the books change. Yeah, yeah, so now yeah. the answers are different, or there's two added answers that are trick. Uh, some 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 multiple questions are trick questions. We need to take that into account as well. Okay, but I just need to know it's not unethical to 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 use them for study purposes. No. Study purposes for guidance. For the structure, how everything is structured, you can do that. But take okay. into consideration uh, that the curriculum changes, I it change, expands. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes even the prescribed book changes. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Basically, I want us to understand what academic writing is all about. We are in higher education, and all of us, we need to learn on how to write, uh, give out a better academic writing in various aspects. I think all of us now, we need to be aware that we, we are going to be faced with uh, acad academic writing, especially in our field in higher education, all right? In, in, regard, in regardless to your field of study, academic writing will be there, all right? Because we expect you to read and also to comprehend academic text. In other words, you must be able to, to, to read an academic text and also be able to put it according to your own understanding. I think the other colleague asked a question in regards to his submission, whereby at the end of the day, the plagiarism level is so high. So in other words, we expect you also to comprehend and have an understanding on a, an academic text. Could be a paragraph, could be maybe a sentence and so on, so that at the end of the day, you are, you are able to provide better information around the academic text you are, you, you, you are writing, all right? So we are expected to do that, whether we'd like it or not, in, in this area of, acad uh, of higher learning. But if you can move to the next slide, uh, there are other aspects which you need to understand. The first thing we need to understand is that what is academic literacy, all right? If you talk about literacy, we are referring to people who can be able to do other aspects. For example, literacy in, in counting, literacy in reading, and so on. Now, the academic literacy itself, I like this definition from the Northwest University. I'm not saying that it's the best one, but I found it, it touches on what actually academic literacy is all about. I think I've lost the presentation from my site, but it's fine. I'll proceed because I don't have time uh, to wait for it to come up. 
we have lost it. But basically, your academic literacy, it refers to the ability to successfully navigate, understand, interpret, and also produce text in the academic environment. In other words, you should be able to interpret and also be able to understand and also able to navigate a text so that when you are writing in this space, your writing become more understandable. Remember that when you talk about academic literacy and academic writing, you are not writing for, for, for yourself. You are writing for a certain audience. So the other aspect about academic uh, literacy is that it has a great impact over how a person expresses and presents themselves in a scholar scholastic environment. In other words, in this higher learning environment, you should be able to present yourself. Hence, we always say in your academic writing, we also expect you to have your own voice. I'll talk about the, your own voice in one of the slides there. But there are some of the aspects which refer to them as the hidden skills of, of academic literacy. We have a lot of skills, but some of these skills, they need to come up when you are faced with academic literacy. What are those skills? Reading and study skills, it's one of those skills, all right? And the other skill which also is hidden, it's also called the reflective skill. What is reflective skills? I always say to my student, you need to be a reflective practitioner. You need to go back and check what has uh, gone uh, bad and how to improve. If you do academic writing, we always do that. That's why you talk about drafts. You have the first draft, the second draft, and the third draft. And as you are looking at all of these drafts, you are looking at how to improve each of the, of the drafts which you have. And also the other skill, which is also hidden in academic literacy, it is your communication skills. You should be able to write clear and also a well-informed uh, inform, uh, aspect. And also you should be able to, to, uh, to embrace writing in various genres. Writing is not one-sided. It has various aspects, all right? Sometimes you call them uh, genres. Huh? And in that case, we look at aspects like, for example, how to put an argument, how to, to write a, a, a comparative uh, uh, text, and also how to put your voice. What's your voice? Your voice is your understanding. Your voice is how you see an aspect. And remember that your voice comes from you as a writer, okay? And in, in academic writing, we always say at the end of the day, you must have a, an outcome. If you write for publication purposes, definitely your voice is going to be cited. Someone are going to indicate the aspect which you have, you have put in a certain text according to your own voice. All right. And the other one is uh, thinking skills. All right, which sometimes refer to them critical thinking skills. Those are some of the academic literacy which are hidden. All right, in form of skills. Remember that when you look at uh, your thinking skills, we look at aspects like how to draw a conclusion, how to make and test inferences, how to write hypotheses, okay? And also the ability to engage and analyze high order thinking question. I think most of you, you are familiar with what you call the Bloom's taxonomy. If you look at the Bloom's taxonomy, it has a, a level on how our thinking should be. We have the lower order and also the higher order. If, if you look at the lower order, it's more sometimes when you look at knowledge-based aspect. But when you go to the higher order, it's where you talk about application. When you write, you should also be able to apply and put knowledge in practice. Okay. Let's quickly look at what academic writing is all about. Slide four, thank you. Basically, academic writing is a formal style of writing. It's very formal. I was looking at the chart now, colleagues. I'm not a critical person, but the conversation we're having on this MS, MS team chart, somewhere it's not formal, all right? Why do I say it's not formal? The way we present our thoughts on the chart. Colleagues have used their different African languages. I don't have a problem of that. It's good. Or it's not formal, basically. But when you look at academic writing, it is formal. It has a structure. Okay? 
If you, mm -hmm. if you are asked to write an assignment, there must be a structure. If they ask you to write an essay or a paragraph, there must be a structure. And also academic writing, uh, it, it is being used mostly in academia. We are in academia. In other words, we are in an academic space and we refer to it as an academia uh, 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 spectrum, all right? And that academia phase or spectrum, it's more applicable in higher learning institutions. It could be colleges, it could be TVET, it could be universities. And also it has to do with publication purposes. We don't write for the sake of writing, all right? And colleagues, I want to share with you I must make sure that I look at my time because I'm given 20 minutes. I want to share with you guys, you may think that when you do your honors or your undergraduate, your writing is not being acknowledged. Somewhere your writing is being picked up because it's been archives. That's why we say it has to do with purpose of publication. And also it is an unbiased. Remember that why you say academic writing is unbiased? It does not align to one point of view. When you write academically, you must also embrace other scholars' views or, or, or ideas, okay? You should not rely on only one view. Sometimes when you look at our students, when you say to them, write a literature study, you find that the student went out and cited only one author, and that is biasness. Unbiasedness means you need to provide different author's point of view, because sometimes those authors, they may agree on a certain aspect or may they, they may disagree on a certain aspect. It is also clear and, and precise, all right? In other words, when I read your work, I should know what actually you are saying in that work. That's why we say to you, we don't expect any jargons, all right? And also slangs. The terminology or slangs which you use in our townships, for example, if you look at the, the common one nowadays, we talk about, uh, uh, I don't want to be more, uh, try to talk people down, but we have something in our townships where there are people who refer to them as a nyaupe boys. It's a slang. So if I put a slang in my writing, I need to explain it. Remember that you are not writing for yourself. You are writing for a global audience, whether it could be an undergraduate or postgraduate. And some of your global audience are not familiar with that type of a slang, so you must explain it, all right? And also, the language should not be vague. It should be clear. Give a language which people will be able to understand. And interesting about academic writing is that it needs to be well sourced. In other words, you should be able to support your claim. How do you do that? You must make sure that you use credible sources. What do you mean by that? We, need, we talk about sources which have been peer reviewed. Right? By peer reviewed, you mean that your writing has been seen by other external people. For example, if I write a piece of paragraph and I put it on TikTok, I can't use that one as my, as my source because no one has viewed it. It's my own understanding, all right? But if I write a piece of paragraph and I put it in an art in the journal and there's someone who has peer reviewed it, then I can use that source as a reliable source. So you must make sure that you use mostly of credible and reliable sources. And also, I've just made an example here, colleagues. I'm not, a, I'm not saying that I want to fight with uh, Wikipedia, but I'll always avoid it. Avoid it. And this is the one of, of most of the non-credible sources. Because remember that in, in Wikipedia, I can go to your Wikipedia and update your information without, without you knowing. I got access to that. So it's not peer reviewed. I'm not sure about TikTok. I'm not sure about YouTube, but I try always to use article, all right? Or if I use dissertations or thesis, it's good because they are also peer reviewed. And also it needs to be correct and consistent. Academic writing, it must be consistent. And I'll make a simple example. I'm coming from the, the field of education. And sometimes we refer to our practitioners at schools as teachers and sometimes as educators. So in my writing, if I choose to, to use the phrase teacher, it should, I should use it throughout the whole writing. 
If I try to use the word educator, I should use that terminology throughout my writing. I, we need to have consistency, all right? And also you need to adhere to the correct grammar, punctuations, and also citation. Remember, by, 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 by citation, we have what you call in-text citation. By in-text citation, it means inside the text, all right, or inside the document, you cite the sources you have used. Then you also have at the end, which you refer to, I think my other colleagues refer to it as a bibliography. And sometimes you refer to it as a reference list. So in, you need also to have those aspects in your academic writing. Whether it's a PowerPoint presentation, you must make sure that you adhere to some of those aspects, okay? Here, I'm just trying to give you the, the different types of um, academic writing, all right? There are lots of them. I'm not going to explain each one of them. You have your assignment. I think most of you are familiar with your assignment. Basically, in all of these uh, types of academic writing, your assignment, essay, research paper, thesis, dissertation, research proposal, research report, uh, there are many. The essence is that each one of them, it has its own particular structure, all right? So you need to write according to the structure. Your assignment, most of the time, they'll give you a topic. Then you have to indicate the introduction, your, your discussion, and also your conclusion. The essay almost similar, but your research paper or article also it got its own structure. Okay. Most of the time, it has an abstract, your keywords, the introduction, uh, the methodology, and also it talks about uh, findings and results, and yeah. That the conclusion. So you have to adhere to that structure, okay? And sometimes they talk about in um in this type of of of, of academic writing, like your research um, articles, they will ask you also to talk a little bit about the uh, different type type of reference style. So you need to adhere to that structure. Remember that you have a lot of reference styles. So it depends which one they ask you to write about. All right, the thesis and dissertation. What's the difference between the two? If, for example, I do my postgraduate, then at the end of, of my postgraduate, I come, uh, I come with a document for my masters. We refer to it as a dissertation. But if I come with a document for my PhD, we refer to it as a thesis. The difference mostly is that the length of these two uh, academic documents are not the same, and also the level are not the same. Then you have your research proposal also. It has it got all its own structure. Your research report. But the difference between the two, your research proposal and your research report, um, I always put it simple to my student. The first one, which is your research proposal, it means you are talking about there is still an intention. It's what you want to research about. You have not done it. All right. In other words, that's your intention. And also the tense when you write the research report is different from the tense when you write your, uh, your research proposal. So your research proposal, basically, it's something which you are intending to do. That's why we always we, we indicate that we write it in the, in the future tense. You are still to, going to do that. But the research report, because now you are giving an undertaking on what we have done. So you can put it in the present tense or maybe in the past tense, okay? So the writing are quite not the same. And also when you look at the structure, yes, there are elements which are common, okay? In these two type of, um, of academic writing documents, okay? I want us to look at the next point. <laughs> Let's quickly look at some of the processes in academic writing. I've just cited this author here, all right? I've used the word et al. If you can look at, the, uh, at that uh, part here, at this block, I've got something like Balfour et al. Et al means that it's more than one author. There are, I think there are four or five. So I didn't want to put them at once. I just put them uh, one term, which we call it et al. Et al means there are many, all right? It's not only one Balfour. That's why I have to put it here so that students should know that the information I'm presenting it here, I've took it from this uh, writing. Then I have to do an in-text citation. This is an in-text citation, okay? And when you go to my reference list at the end, I need to include all the authors 
not only PALFO, I need to include the other authors. And that's how we say to our students, that's how we account to other people's ideas. Because if you don't account to other people's ideas and you make it your own, that is plagiarism. We are stealing. And remember that stealing, it's a, it's, it's a serious offense. Colleagues are going to share that with you in the next presentation. But basically, these are the processes. Briefly, the first one, in any academic writing, you start by doing a preparation. You prepare. Then after you've done your preparation, you plan. Then you start to have your drafts, all right? And after you have your drafts, then you start to revise all these drafts and also you edit them. Then from there, you do what you call proofreading. And I like the last one, proofreading. I've seen students when they submit the assignment, they don't do proofreading. And the reason why most students are not doing proofreading is that they are not able to manage their time. The assignment is due on Tuesday by midnight. A student starts the assignment a day before. You don't even have time to proof, proof, proof read your assignment. And if you don't proof read, you end up submitting work which have errors and inconsistency. So proofreading assists us to overcome the errors in our academic writing, and it also uh, assists us to, to have consistency in our uh, academic writing. And also it assists us to verify also the referencing style, which is expected in that type of an assignment or in that type of a writing. But your preparation, it means you need to be aware about the question which you want to answer. Because remember that if you don't have a clarity in regards to the question, there are times where you need to check, especially when you revise and edit your work. You need to check if you are, the, your research questions which you have during your preparation is being answered. So if you don't have it here, definitely you are not going to check for that. All right? You also need in your preparation to identify your audience. Who are your audience? My presentation today, colleagues, I know that's for my, my undergraduate students, but I infuse also my postgraduate students. So those are my audience. Okay, that's why my presentation, I need to put it in that level so that I'm able to cater for my undergraduate uh, uh, students and also my postgraduate students who are doing their, their honors. And also you need to plan. Planning is, is key. And when you plan, you need to be able to put information together and develop a structure. I always say to my students, when you plan, sometimes I use mind maps. In my planning, I brainstorm. There are a lot of things I do in her, when I plan my academic writing. And also, I start to have different drafts. I can have the first draft. Then from there, I'll read it and revise it. Then I could have the second draft and so on. And if I can share with you colleagues now, I've seen that my students who are writing their masters, when they, say they, when they come with four drafts for only one chapter, they feel that is too much. But when you look at the actual content itself, you see gradual improvement in each of those chapters. So the drafts are very important also, okay? And also you need to revise and edit your work. I've spoken about that one, and I've spoken about proof uh, reading. Can you please go to the next slide? Thanks, Memakola. I think the next slide, sometimes when we write, especially sections like your literature study sections okay we've seen the students most of the time they write what i call mono, monotonous writing especially in academic a student will start with a, a sentence at the end of the sentence a student will cite the source the students come with the second sentence the same approach it's a sentence at the end the source or maybe the student at the, at, the, at the start of the sentence, a student to start with the words according to, to, to Kupega. Then from the next sentence, according to, 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 to Peter. The next sentence, according to this person. So it becomes more monotonous. So we are supposed to use various connective words in and in between sentences. And these are some of the connective words, colleagues, which we can use. 
they are quite interesting, some of them. We use them for different usage, all right? For example, if I want to add an information that is a connective weight or weight which I can use, I can use the weights like also, apart from this, in addition, further and furthermore. If, for example, I want to emphasize something, all right? The connective weight or weight which I can use there, I can choose any one of this. I can use the weight, in fact, interesting, more importantly. Think about if I, I write my sentence in this way, not using only one weight and various weights as I want to emphasize something. If, for example, I want to put a condition, I can use this connective weight. In that case, or if. If in a, in a situation where I want to show a contrast, how these two views differ, all right, or not according to each other, I could use these connective ways like alternatively, although, however, despite, and so on. In a case where I want to emphasize a cause of a thing, all right, which are the connective ways I can use, some of those ways are due to the effect of, since there are many conditions, I could not put all of them here. The other one is also important. If I want to emphasize an effect or the effect of something, the connective weights which I can use there, I can use the connective wave like accordingly. I can use the connective weights like, for example, therefore or hence. That emphasize the effect of something. Qualification also. And, con and concession, the collective which I can use there is even though, however, obviously, there are many of them colleagues, I can't put all of them there. But the other one's also important, if I want to, to have a, a usage in regards to time order, okay? What are the collective which I can use there? I can use the word next, I can use the words earlier, finally, and the other one, which is common, I can also use connective ways like firstly, then from there in the, sec in the second sentence, I can use a connect connective way like secondly, thirdly, and sometimes we use lastly. Okay, so those are the connectives which I can use when I want to, um, to emphasize time order. Well, these are some of the, of the pointers. I think I refer to them as pointers. Why do I refer to them as pointers? Those are, I think, are the pointers which you can take into consideration when you want to write a coherent academic piece of writing. All right. In other words, if you want your 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 writing to be more be more coherent, these are some of the pointers. All right. There are many colleagues. Okay. But firstly, I think you need to present your writing in a thematic format. I always say that, especially at this level. When I write my literature study section, I need to use headings. Okay. Then I can also, after I've done with my head, I have the main heading, then I could have subheading, then a paragraph based on that subheading. Then I could have sub subheading and also maybe a paragraph. The reason why I emphasize this aspect of writing, so that if whoever is reading your work, we look at the subheading. Let's say the subheading is about um, understanding of staff development, and you have two paragraphs around there. Then whoever is looking at your work will check if your paragraphs are talking to the subheadings. Because if you don't write in that way, you may find that the, the paragraphs you are giving there in that subheading are not even talking to the subheading itself. They're talking about something else. So as a reader, when I look at the subheading, I'm expecting this aspect. And when I go to the paragraphs, they must also direct me to the subheadings. So it's an easy way of writing. Okay. And the other important is that colleagues will say to you, your sentence or your paragraph should be at least four, five, or six sentences. All right? It can be uh, 10 sentences, at least four or five. Sometimes go to six. Okay? And what's important when you want your writing to be more clearer, you need to state the argument or an argument by a certain author or arguments by certain scholars or authors. All right? In where you indicate maybe to say author so and so 
agree with author B, whereas author C has a disagreement with author A and B because of this and that. And also you can also put the con contrast there, okay? And in that writing again, you can also put your own voice. What are you saying? Your, your own voice can come from your own observation. It can come, it's, it's a sort of your own contribution. Remember that we are talking about academic writing. Academic writing, it's about bringing something in the academia, all right? We don't expect you to go out and tell us about so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And so and so. What are you saying? What's your voice? Do you have something to bring in? You can bring your voice from some of the land aspects from your context, okay? Take, for example, if they ask you to define concept or keywords. Good, you define them according to different scholars. But at the end, you also need to give your own definition of the concept. And in that way, you are adding to the science, all right? And as you are adding to the science, you are also saying, here I am, and I also need to be cited by other authors. It's also important to make sure that you keep to the topic. Always. Sometimes we come, we, we, we become all over the place. All right. And, and I know that we, sometimes we are excited by many things as students. All right. And it's good to be excited, but we need to narrow our excitement. So that if I write something, always I must think about the topic. All right, or the title of my research paper or whatever you're writing about. The topic is more important. Write something in the form of paragraph or paragraphs. At the end, read and check, does it talk or align to my topic? If it's no, it means you need to put it aside. All right, it's not going to work. All right, paraphrase. I think my colleague, uh, Ms. Mazuko spoke about paraphrasing. All right, and also you need to paraphrase and cite authors remember that scholars they want to be cited you also want to be cited okay so you need to paraphrase as much as possible and when you paraphrase it means you read something and put it in your own understanding but what's important about paraphrasing we know that whatever you are paraphrasing you took it somewhere what i could get a sentence that some sentence was written by someone else. So when you paraphrase, take some few key phrases, maybe one or two, okay? And add your own touch or your own understanding. If you feel that you have tried to paraphrase this sentence, but you, you realize that even though you have taken two or key phrases from the original author, and you are not sure to say, when I submit it to a, any tool, where I want to check uh, the, the ten uh, the it in level, won't it be so high? The easiest way, you also need to cite the author. There's nothing wrong with that. I'll always do that, all right? If I feel that I can't even paraphrase, I always give direct quotation. But remember that you can't put the whole section with direct quotations, okay? But there are times I feel that, yeah, I'm not going to, to, to bother myself with paraphrasing. Let me go for direct quotations. It's been allowed. Also, you must write in a third person stance. I'm not sure if the, the, the phrase, the concept stance is correct there. But we always say avoid to use the word I. You know, sometimes the writing a student say, give your own voice. Then the student will start to say, I, I, I. No. It's too much. The third person, all right? When you write in the form of a third person, you need to identify people by proper nouns, all right? For example, teacher and so on. You also need to give the, 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 the pronouns. You can use she, he, him, her, and so on. You can also use what you call uh, I think I've got three of them there. No, I think, yeah, it's fine. But, but, but basically, the third person is the best way to write. If I avoid to use the word I, I always say to my student, use the word the researcher. Right? It stands for I as a person. Instead of being the, the word I, it becomes more ecocentric. Okay? 
Acronyms and abbreviations, colleagues, please make sure that you use them correctly. Some of the, make sure that there are some of the acronyms and abbreviations, which are standard abbreviations. Use them. Don't create your own. You know, sometimes you come with all these acronyms or abbreviations which are not standard, we've been standard used. So in that case, if you want to create your own, describe it. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Your language, when you write, please always use the, the UK version, all right? Sometimes you call it the English one. You should not use the USA version. These are the examples. If I want to write the word color, this is the required one, all right? The UK one. Not this one, where I spell it C-O-L-0-R, all right? The same thing with organizing. We don't use the word organizing with a Z. We use an S. Okay. So I know that when you try, try to check your grammar, your grammar will want you to use the, the USA one. Please ignore that always. Okay. And that's what you call the proper usage of the language. In our case, we use the UK version one. Okay. In South Africa. And also avoid to use. Numeric or percentage when you start a sentence. Okay. If I want to present, for example, 100%, I can't write 100% in a new numeric form. I need to write it in weights. Except in a case, for example, uh, basically that's what, that's what we want you to, you to do. All right. But when the other aspect is also important, I think you must also bear note of this one. I want to, touch, want to touch on that one quickly. If numbers are less than zero, I mean less than 10, sorry, you need to write them in weights. Okay. Let's say it's 30 participants or 30 teachers. I must write it in weights. All right. If it's 10. But except in the case where it's a, a normal value. Like, for example, if I want to present a, uh, one kilometer, I can, cannot write it in weight. I'll write it in numerical. Sometimes we have tables. We also need ex expect consistency in our tables and figures and so on. Always a table, it needs to have a, a, a caption and there must be consistent. If you put it at the top of a table, it should be throughout the top of a table in all of the tables which we had in that, uh, in that document. If you put them at the bottom, they should be at the bottom. Okay, I've just given an example there of a table there. Yeah. Make sure that you balance your sources. I've spoken about that one. And when you balance your sources, you indicate and demonstrate that you understand and you have knowledge. Don't use one source. Use various sources, all right? Don't use only articles. Use also aspects which you take from, from the ordinary books. Use thesis, all right? So, so that you balance your sources. And consider other scholars' point of view so that you must avoid biasness. Yes, Dr. Quigley, you mentioned two forms of communication, the USA and the UK. So now you encourage us that we follow the UK one. Now I want to know if, for any reason, a student decided to use the USA one. Will there be any negative effect in terms of max allocation for that particular student. That's number one. And then number two, quickly, doctor. During your presentation, you also mentioned monotonous writing. Also, I just want to know, is it more about the monotony of how you write or the correctness of the content? And those are the two questions that I quickly want to, to understand. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Uh, I, th I think I was referring, especially when you write second section, for example, in regards to your literature study. We want that part of a section, even your whole academic writing, it must tell a story. And in order for it to tell a story, your writing should not be monotonous, all right? 
And in order to avoid to have a monotonous writing, we encourage you to use various connective weights in between, in and between sentences. Like I'll give you a simple example. I can't start if, for example, I have a paragraph with five uh, sentences. With five sentences. I cannot start all these five sentences with the word according to John. The next sentence according to Peter. The next sentence according to, to Marcus and so on. It's boring. Somewhere I need to try to make sure that I link these ideas. All right? I can say maybe the first sentence according to John. The, the argument is this and that and that. Whereas Peter has a contrary view. Can you, use, uh, can you see now I'm trying to use a, a, a connective weight so that mm. I become, I writing becomes more uh, interesting and it tells a story. That's why we say try as much as possible to use some of these connective weights. But remember that these connective weights, we don't use them randomly. You need to know what are you trying to communicate. Right? If, for example, I want you to, to add on the previous point, right? Then I can use connective weight like also apart from this and so on. Okay? I cannot just say if I want to add on the argument from point uh, for scholar A, then I want to add what scholar B is saying. Then I decide, then I start to use the weight, uh, the connective weight like Q2. It's a wrong one, all right? It's not an addition collective weight. So you need to be careful about base collective weight. Try to use them and you'll see your writing is going to be more interesting. And that's where sometimes it becomes more coherent, all right? And even the reader, whoever is going to read your work, will also have an interest in reading your work. The other one, I think it has to do with, uh, I think I've missed the, the, the other, the other question. Oh, it, it, it's where I, I was speaking about the language to say in our South African context, especially higher education, I think almost of, most of all of them, we, we, we are encouraged to use the, the UK version, right? When you write academic, it's a standard. And there's no way you are going to be penalized. The only time you can be penalized, if maybe in your academic writing, let's say it was an, ass it was an assignment, and they've stipulated clearly in the instructions that you must use this type of, of, of writing. If they said you must use the UK version in your writing, then you decide to come with the, with the USA. Then you're going to be penalized. Okay? But if it was not stated clear, clearly in the, in, in the instructions, whoever is going to read your work is going to give you feedback to say, kindly change this type of writing because it's more USA aligned. And I, I don't know the reason why. Remember that we have what we call the blogs, but I've seen with myself sometimes. I, I, there's one a paper I've submitted last and picked up the last day. They, I've, I've written it according to the UK version. Unfortunately, the publisher, they wanted the USA version. So I have to ad adhere to their, to their structure, okay, to change everything. But I think that's, a, I don't know the main reason, honestly, but it's what we've been told. Um, and I think also at UNISA should be that one. And that's why we say consistency should be applicable. And if you look at our, uh, uh, at our um, if, you, if you type whatever, by a weight or what, of Excel and so on, if you want to type it using the UK version, it's the time. You see the uh, sort of, um, a, a red underlining in the weight. And when you check the spelling, it wants the, the U, USA version part of it. So I always ignore it, but I make sure that I'm consistent in my writing. I think that's how far I can respond to those two questions. Thank you.
to ask because I had doctors saying um, if you called or cite one um, author, then it will be like you're biased. So I wanted to know the maximum number of um, authors that you can cite or reference at the end of your assignment or research. How many numbers, the minimum is the maximum that we can put in there? Okay, I think in that case, if it's an assignment, sometimes they can even indicate the actual number, okay? Sometimes they'll say you, you should cite maybe 20 authors or scholars, okay? And it doesn't mean that you must go and read 20 books or articles. Because from one article, you can find maybe five or six, even 10, or maybe all the, the, the scholars can find them in one article, which I doubt, all right? But in a case where they don't indicate, they don't quantify it, it also depends on your level of writing. We can't expect you when you are writing, for example, in your, in, in your master's, to have 2,000 uh, cited authors. It's too much, okay? So it means you didn't add your voice. There's nothing which is coming from you as, as a researcher. But we expect to have a reasonable number of cited authors. And remember that when you cite your author, right, you must make sure that you don't use old information. The only time maybe we can use old information, if, for example, we are, we are writing in your theoretical framework, all right? Or maybe if you are writing, maybe not even in your methodology, because most of the methodological textbook or, or, or piece of work have been upgraded on a yearly basis. Okay? <laughs> or if you feel that this source is a 1942 source and it carries weight in your writing, it could be there. But what I say to you, your sources, they should not be more than 10 years. And I'm moving from 10 years. I always say to my students, they should not be more than five years. You need to give us the latest sources. Otherwise, if you're not able to give us the latest sources, it means your study becomes more old or your research. And why we say at least five years? Because take, for example, I'm just playing with this. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not closing for this. If I'm writing for my PhD, PhD takes almost five years. Five. If I have sources which are 20 years old, by the time I complete my, my PhD, those sources, which they will be 25 years old now. And when I try to publish, they're a bit older. So, but if it's five years, by the time I publish, it means my sources will be almost six years or seven years. But remember that is one of the technicalities we need to look at. But how many sources you need to put in your reference list, it also depends on your level of writing. And also if they, a there's a certain requirement which has been stipulated. Uh, my name is um, um, I'm just going to highlight um, what plagiarism is in an academic context. Um, the previous speakers uh, have alluded to say um, plagiarism, it's, a, it's like if you want to use a strong language, uh, it's like stealing. Uh, when I was preparing this um, workshop, this presentation, I was intrigued by um, some of the people and countries, how they perceive this plagiarism. Countries like India and Poland, they consider plagiarism as a criminal offense, where they actually even jail you because they equate it to stealing, is theft. So now, uh, you as our students, when you come to the university, to this very structured environment, we, we want to equip you uh, with the skills to say, how do you avoid this plagiarism? And I think my colleague, um, Mr. Pizeng, is going to uh, talk about that in length. So simple um, a term or explanation, plagiarism is when you use words, ideas or information from sources without citing correctly. 
I want you to underline the, 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 the word citing correctly. Sometimes you might cite, but then you don't cite correctly. So that became, becomes plagiarism. So what you need to do as students is that uh, you need to make sure that your citations is up to date. There is no fault in that. And I want to add to say sometimes uh, these citations or referencing, they are college based. So you need to check in your tutorial letter to say what is the preferred way maybe of referencing. So citing correctly is very, very key because you might say, no, but I have cited. But the question is, did you cite it correctly? Um, so uh, to my role to say, what are the different types of plagiarism? I didn't even take all of them. There are many. Uh, number one, it's a complete plagiarism. I, I think this one is self-explanatory. To say it is when you submit someone's work in your own name. That one, I'm sure this is the one that India and Poland will jail you because this is really a theft in its highest degree. Because you're taking somebody's work and then you delete their names and then you put your name. The, the, this one, I don't know, it's a, for me, it's, a, it's the biggest heist that I can do. I can indicate that is number one. And then we have verbatim plagiarism. This verbatim plagiarism is just directly copying and pasting someone's work without even citing, without even quotation marks. You just take it, copy, paste in your assignment or exam, and you expect that uh, that crime won't, won't be seen. So we need to be very, very, very careful to say when we, 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 we write our work, especially when we are paraphrasing or uh, summarizing, we need to be very sure to say, do we understand how to paraphrase? It has been said so many times. So this verbatim, uh, it is linked to paraphrasing, to say when you paraphrase, this is another type of plagiarism because what you do uh, in paraphrasing uh, plagiarism, it's when you just tweak words, you just, you just um, change way, a word there, if maybe it was a, 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 a today, and then you just say now, you know, something like that, you, ju you just twist words, but you are saying the same thing. So this is a, 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 a paraphrasing plagiarism, and this is where now you need to understand how to paraphrase which is now what we offer you in our workshops. We cannot uh, give you, I cannot give you many examples now. Dr. Kubega tried that to say, how do you paraphrase? So you must be very, very clear so that you must not commit an offense that is called paraphrasing plagiarism. And the fourth one is self-plagiarism. This one, it's, a, it, it's sort of like a raises some eyebrows because I was like, okay, if it's self-plagiarism, uh, uh, if this is my work, reusing your own previous work without acknowledging it. Here, my understanding is that uh, when you say, for instance, you have done a part of your work, say you are on a third year level, or you have done a very a beautiful piece of work, and then in your previous, uh, maybe say you are in first year or maybe even in your high school, if you are from high school, then you take that work, it's your work, and then you come here and present it as something new. So what you need to do here, not to self plagiarize, is to acknowledge, to say, actually to declare. Because when, when, when you acknowledge, you are declaring, to say, I want to use this work in my previous whatever encounter. Then, uh, I'm bringing it here to the new context. So this is now where you avoid self-plagiarism. Uh, the next one is source-based plagiarism, where 
I, I think there was a one student who asked to say, if I'm using a single resource, uh, and then you are saying I need to, I, I, I need to cite. How do you go about it? It cannot be that uh, in this single source, and then you just everything. It's about this one source. It's about this one source because remember, Dr. Kubeka indicated to say we want to hear different perspectives. What are other sources saying? What are other uh, authors saying? What are other writers saying? And then, then you bring in your voice. And over and above, you need to have a proper citation. You need to cite to say. This is the author. This is uh, this information. I took it from this source, and then this is what the the, the 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 author is saying. And then this is my voice. Then this this the the last one. It's accidental plagiarism. Here it's when a writer unintentionally. You see, in contrary to the complete plagiarism, this one is accidental where the, the, the author or you as a student, you are, you are not like plagiarizing intentionally, but then you happen to take someone's work and then you <coughs> make it yours. So um, it, 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 one can tell to say this was not um, maybe intentional. I, I mean, when you go to, when Miss, Miss Mazibugo will be calling you to disciplinary uh, hearing and whatever, they can tell that this was not intentional because this offense, it can really jeopardize your future as students. Uh, I normally say when uh, I'm conducting workshops to say, you know, you might lose a lot of benefits when you plagiarize. If you are an NS first student, for instance, you might lose even your, your funding because you have committed a crime because the outcome of the disciplinary hearing once you are found guilty, you know, you, you might lose some of the benefits. So, hence, we try by all means to induct you, to orientate you to say, make sure uh, that you, we, you don't plagiarize. Because some of the uh, uh, offenses or plagiarism that you commit, it's because you are not clear. And what, 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 what I want to uh, pledge with you, or maybe to, to really emphasize, is to say, try to cite correctly. Be in liaison with the, 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 the college where your qualification is coming from to say, what is the right way? Acknowledge, how do I acknowledge the, 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 the resources? How do I credit, you know, the, the person who has written whatever the, the topic or the, the subject matter that you're talking about? Because sometimes it differs uh, according to the to the colleges. How do you reference? Because this is where now my colleague uh, uh, Ms. Biteng is going to talk about. Referencing is very, very critical. And, and this will be the end of my presentation to say for you to fare very, very, very well. I want to urge you to say, please attend the workshops, which will be uh, broadcasted or advertised on my UNISA, my live. Dr. Kubeka is one of our uh, our facilitators. I mean, you could tell that uh, he's very conversant, he's very well experienced, he's very good. But if you, at, you, if you attend this workshop only today, you will miss a lot because now in the workshops, that's where now uh, he is going to break these topics by chunks, little chunks. Every session, he will be talking about this, and then another session. It's not only him. We've got other, other facilitators who will be offering this workshop. So I want to urge you, keep on checking uh, these links, which will be posted on my UNISA or my life, so that you can polish your, your, your skills of referencing, of citing, of acknowledging, of giving credentials to the author that you are trying to, to utilize their work. Because it's very sad, you know, for you to have gone a, an extra mile of managing to register at UNISA, only to find that you lose your, you know, your, your, your studies, because sometimes you don't know, sometimes it's a matter of 
uh, cutting corners and then you just cut and paste and then without knowing. But in my view, I think generally is, is lack of knowledge. But we are saying we are here as the regions to say, attend these workshops. You don't even have to drive to a venue. You connect online and then you attend your workshops. You can interact with your facilitators and ask questions to say, here is my writing. Did I reference uh, uh, correctly? Did I cite it correctly? That is what our facilitators are there for. So please don't ignore these workshops. Use your two hours in a day. The day has got 24 hours. So if you utilize two hours or so, then you polish your skills. You know that you are doing the right thing. Uh, Chairperson, I think that will be the end of my presentation. And thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Uh, so I just wanted to ask, is it possible that you can send us maybe um, a, a, uh, a perfect assignment for somebody who answered the, 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 the questions accordingly to what you prefer on your side so that we can see and be directed how we can uh, go around about writing our assignments as we are first year students. Good day. Um, thank you so much. I do not have a question. I would really like to make a suggestion considering the fact that I see that a whole lot of us uh, struggled with uh, citing and references. So I was thinking that uh, it would be great if these kind of workshops or presentations were to be held before we even uh, submit our assignments because I'm here. I've submitted three assignments already and I'm thinking, uh, will I be flaked? Will I be, you know, because I was not uh, properly prepared for this. But after this workshop, I am 100% sure of what is it that is required when one does an assignment, you know. So uh, I think also the university needs to understand that uh, referencing is something very new to the first, uh, first year students. So most of us might have uh, plagiarized without even realizing that we we, we, we didn't uh, we, we plagiarized. So yes, these kind of workshops, if they were to be held before we start with our studies, then I think um, the issue of plagiarism might just be a little lower as time goes by. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hilda. But I think it's important that you must be always on the lookout for for these workshops <clears throat> uh, because they are. They are there all the time. And then if you check through your my UNISA or my life, you will be able to um to pick up um some of the workshops and then attend. Um I mean before, before we even start with our studies, before we even get our assignments, like as soon as one is finalized or uh, yes, or something like that, then this okay. kind of workshop, yeah, before classes, if I might if I may put it like that. All right. That is what I meant. Uh, okay. Thank you so right. much. Yeah, I'm just to have a bit of a question or a, and also most like a concern because what happened is that I've noticed for my, for example, myself who is studying become in my third year, I will personally receive like SMS, which is personal in my name and the exact module that I'm doing that, hey, Franz happy, this is there, you're doing this module here, They'll be offering you a, to write an exam for you. Of so, my question is like, how, what is UNICEF doing to protect our like our information being sold to the third parties? So, who are actually addressing us with our exactly our names and modules? So that is obviously like that, that our information is being leaked, and that 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 is mostly uh, I believe is one of the most important thing which is actually challenges students in such a way they become tempted because like they're offering you an exam or assignment at 300 which is already written and all cited and everything what do you do you just actually edit and do your names submit which that's my concern and question thank you yes happy we 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 are aware of that actually the university is aware of that to say um according to popia act your information needs to be protected but um mm, you know, the crime rate in South Africa is too high because this is one of the crime. Because what I can assure you, a UNISA will never charge you. The minute you hear or you receive an SMS to say um, 
there is a workshop or we will do your ex your, your your assignments or you will do your exams you must know that that is not from uh, unisa is from this bogus um i don't know institutions these people who are making money uh, through our vulnerable students and uh, we we are really really trying by all means to try and 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 deal with this matter as the university so the university it's it's very much away uh, uh, happy so we are trying by all means the university will never once you see the amount that has been put for you to do some uh, workshop or they will write your exams and whatever it, that is not from unisa but i uh, i want to take responsibility to say yes it is our duty as the university to protect your information i remember last year it uh, it seems as if people who are leaking that information, uh, they will be held accountable because that is a criminal offense. You cannot sell uh, students information to make money. So I'm sure it's a syndicate, but the university is very much aware with that and they're dealing with it. A second question, comment um, to say, can we get maybe a, an example of how to reference and, and stuff. Hence, I said, uh, when I conclude my, uh, present, my short presentation to say, you need to uh, attend these workshops because <laughs> the facilitators, they will take you through. If you attend even the library trainings, because they will be showing you practically to say, this is how we cite. Maybe, for your uh, question or comment, let's wait for Mr. Mpitzeng because they do it practically. They show you, uh, a, 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 I mean, physically so that you can see to say, this is how you cite, this is. But then most of this work, I work a lot with Mr. Zulu. We do it practically when we are conducting workshops. So we we are really sorry that, um, maybe let me acknowledge Butiwi that, uh, you are so right to say we should have done this before you start with our assignment and this is our plan of action to say in the second semester before you immediately when you finish your your, your registration it's unfortunate because unisa system you know isn't it they keep on extending extending so by the time the registration is finalized you find that now assignments are due so now we don't have time to take you through before, but it's a valid point that you are raising to say, we need to prepare you immediately uh, after the registration. But then the glitches are those that, um, you know, the system, you know, we keep on extending by week, by two. Sometimes it's you as students who demand, you know, that we need to extend. So it, it eats up on the time that maybe we're supposed to give you workshops. So, but be on the look to check our 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 workshops because they are very critical. Yes, I know you have submitted already, but you can do better in the second semester if you attend those workshops. I think that that will be my attempt to answer your questions. Thank you. Okay, my topic for today is overcoming plagiarism. Okay, through literature review and referencing. Okay, I was going to define plagiarism and then talk about the best practices to avoid plagiarism, uh, which are literature review, referencing styles, the referencing tools, and then the plagiarism detector tools. Okay, and conclusion. And then that will be my reference. So I'm not going to define, I'm not going to, to talk about plagiarism. Um, Mema Dima has uh, spoke so well about it. So I'm just gonna go straight to the best practices on how to avoid uh, plagiarism. Okay. The best practices to avoid plagiarism. The first thing that you need to do is to do a literature review. Literature review, it's how you critically evaluate what has been published on a topic by accredited scholars and researchers. 
you must underline the accredited scholars and researchers. That is literature review. And then again, it involves you need to be able to identify the information that you want when you do a literature review. You must be able to critic, criticize you analytically so, and then you must interpret and synthesize the information. And then all you must always make sure that the information that you are going to source out is always updated and are always revised as and when the new information is available. I remember a doctor, I think it's Dr. Kubeka, who indicated that uh, especially people who are doing P PhD, normally uh, when you do a literature review, suppose you, you have started your literature review in 20, suppose in 2020, and then, but you are going to complete your qualification, say in 2025. So the information that you have um, provided, the literature review that you have provided in 2020, 2020 will not be relevant in 2025 because like information involved, there's new information that has been added into your topic. So you need to constantly revise and update the information on your literature review. And then the importance of literature review, it helps you to understand the exist existing information on the research topic of your assignment. If you do a literature review, you search for information that is related to your topic, you are able to understand what is really happening in, in this field of study, in this topic that I'm doing an assignment on. And then it, it can also give you information identify the gaps that are missing in, in 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 that topic and then you are able to understand your work and your assignment and then uh, for those who are actually doing the phd and the masters then it can help you to build a theoretical uh, and, 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 and a conceptual framework and then it's also help you to build a foundation for your methodology when you're doing your research doing your Okay, the, the techniques that you can use in order for you to, to get literature review, there's a background noise that is kind of disturbing. Okay, you, you, you can use the library catalog, the academic databases, the institutional repositories. I've just mentioned a few to do a comprehensive okay. search for your assignment of, or for your research topic. Why, what do I mean when I talk about the library catalog? The library catalog, it's just like a normal catalog. I normally give an example of those catalogs that we receive. Normally on a Thursday, we find them at our gate. It's from, um, it's from game, it's from food lovers. Those are catalogs that are they advertise whatever that they have in, in food lovers or in game. But in UNISA or in our library, the library catalog uh, 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 actually gives us information on the books, the resources that we have in our libraries. And then we also have academic databases. There, there's a wide range of databases available in UNISA that you can use to to draw your literature review. And there's also institutional repository. Institutional repository, normally there are theses and dissertations that has been written by students in UNISA about UNISA. There's presentations that were done in UNISA. So in order for you to do a thorough literature review, you need to use those institutional repository to get information on your assignment or your research topics. When you are doing a literature review, you must be able to identify the key things. When you find information inside those uh, academic databases in the institutional repository, in the books, in the articles, you should be able to identify the key things. Obviously, when uh, one or two, two or more people uh, 
find the same uh, information or the findings are actually the same. Those are the themes that should, you should be able to identify and then evaluate the credi credibility of the source by checking the following. Remember, I, 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 I indicated that um, underline the credibility of the author or the scholar. You must be able to check the relevance of your information, the expertise of the author. Uh, some authors are taking chances you, about the subject matter. So you should be able to see the intents of the information that the author has put through uh, uh, in that in that uh, article or inside that book. That is the expertise. How does the author know the subject matter? And then this viewpoint or her viewpoint of that author, you should be able to capture it and uh, uh, when you're doing your literature review. And then mostly the intended audience. Uh, normally the author would, when you read inside, inside the article or inside the book, you should be able to see that the author was writing to this particular people, okay? And then there should also be evidence uh, on on the information that is inside that article or inside that book. Also, importantly, the currency of the information by checking how up to date and recent the information is, and then whether it is still relevant to the topic that is investigated in 2024. If it's not relevant now, what there's no need for you to use that article uh, as part of your literature review. OK, and the other technique that you can use in order to avoid plagiarism is referencing. A lot has been spoken uh, by the previous presenters that uh, you need to acknowledge the original author or the creator of that information. Don't claim the information as if it's yours. That is what we call plagiarism. You need to acknowledge. How do you then acknowledge that author? You need to cite, you need to reference. Uh, if you support the argument and uh, 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 that is written inside that uh, article, you need to reference it and then don't claim it as if it's your work. You need to reference and cite it. OK, and then when you do referencing, it allows you to support the argument that you have in your work and then allow other scholars to have a meaningful debate and then they are able to bring new information into that topic when they discuss, when you write that information inside your assignment and another student bring another information, then that's a, that is a kind of a debate. And then there's new information that has been created. Whether you agree with the author or you see uh, an information you see a gap in that in that information that is provided then that is kind of a debate you're then with your own view based on the sources that you have cited you are able to bring new information and then the referencing also allow you to be aware of the theories and methodologies in that particular field and then uh, again it also enable the reader to trace the, the origin of the work. OK, when you have referenced that information, when you have cited that information, when your lecturer uh, come into contact with your uh, assignment, they, they, have, they need to go back to that source that you have cited and go and read the information and compare it, it with, with what you, you have written so that uh, they can know that this information that is coming from this particular student, it's the original author is Mr. Namatandani for interest sake, then th that way you are able to avoid plagiarism. It also avoid, uh, when you are referencing, you protect the inter in intellectual in integrity to avoid the unauthorized use of information and misinterpretation of information. Like the previous students who just spoke about the, 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 the information, his information being used to, uh, uh, to invite him to come and, and attend a uh, some uh, a tutorial somewhere else that is when you do a referencing if the information is used pro 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 properly you kind of avoid an authorized the an authorized use of that information that the person has 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 access to and then the information is 
misinterpreted. So by now, for the mere fact that the, inf the student has received an invitation from another sources, that is that is a misinterpretation of UNISA as, 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 as an institution. It's like somebody inside the institution has, has used the information to advertise uh, uh, for the tutorial letters, then the, 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 the integrity of the institution is, is kind of, of damaged. So referencing is so important that you need to always, always cite the author and always reference at the end of your, of your, of your, of your assignment of, or of your research. Then there's different types of referencing styles that are in UNISA. Uh, this for the students that are normally coming to the library to request training on referencing. I normally ask them this question. In your tutorial letters, you need to check. Normally it's written that in this department or for this module, you need to use the Harvard referencing style for for, for interest sake. So I normally ask them which referencing style is recommended by your department or by you know, the module, uh, 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 the module that you want to write an assignment. And then if they've gone through their tutorial letter, they'll be able to say to me, uh, I'm supposed to use the reference, the Harvard referencing style or the APA. So in this case, these are the referencing styles that are used in UNISA. The APA, uh, it's mostly used in psychology and education and other social sciences uh, uh, modules. There's also the Ch Chicago referencing style. It is used with all subjects, including books, newspapers, and other non-scholarly publication and materials that are not intended for publication. Uh, Sometimes we write articles, but we the intention is not to publish. Then that's when you can use the, refer, the Chicago referencing style. There's also the Harvard referencing style. This is generally, generally used across many dis, uh, subject disciplines. Uh, referencing Harvard referencing style, it's the one like it's 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 mo it's used mo mostly that that is the most common one that is used in 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 all in most of the subject in UNISA, and then there's also the MLA. Uh, it's used in arts and humanities. Uh, here it says it's used in English languages, literature, folklore, and linguistic courses. That's the MLA referencing system, and there's also the Vancouver system. It's popularly in popular in the physical science and bio, biological science and the health science subjects. Okay, there's also anti-plagiarism software. I I've noted on the on the on the program that the next speaker is going to talk about the software, so I'm not going to go into them. Uh, I don't want to spoil uh, the good things that he that they are bringing to to you. So I'm just going to mention them. There's also there's Turn It In, there's Grammarly, there's Copyscape, Plug Scan, and there's referencing tools, which I'm going to to discuss to or to talk about in the next slide. Okay, in the library, we 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 have RefWorks. Uh, UNISA has subscribed to RefWorks. Yours is just to uh, um, open an account where you are able to drag all your references to RefWorks, and then it it will be able to it can uh, arrange the reference uh, according alphabetically. And then yours, when you're done with your assignment, you just copy whatever that is on the refer of work and paste it on your assignment. It's it's your referencing. It's complete. You can just look at uh, your work and see if it complies with uh, your referencing style that you're supposed to use for your module. And then from there, that you just copy and paste and put it on your assignment. And then there's also EndNote. UNISA does not subscribe to it. You have to purchase it when you're using it. And then there's Mendeley. It's a free referencing tool. Um, and the academic social network allows it in order to manage your reference. It's, 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 it's a software. You download it and then you can also uh, upload all your reference materials. And then it can also 
uh, arrange the reference according to the style of referencing that you prefer. And then the last one is the Zoreto, which is an open source tool that can be used to collect, organize, manage site and share uh, research sources. OK, I tried to do an example of, of referencing the in-text uh, citing as well as, as, well as uh, the reference list. Though they are not alf arranged alphabetically, I was just showing you how to do a single author. If you do an in-text on a single author, then the information is there. And then on the referencing list, that's how you're supposed to use it, especially when you're using the Harvard reference material, the reference type, sorry. And then if you have two or more author, that is how you're supposed to cite your, your to do your in-text. And then that's how you're supposed to do your referencing list at the end of your assignment. And then three or more, that's how it works, just until the end of, 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 of this page. I'm not going to go one by one to all of them. Uh, and then in my conclusion, I would encourage students uh, to check our library website for trainings. We offer trainings on referencing techniques. And then there's also on my UNISA announcement, we advertise our training there. And then there's also on our library notice boards, we advertise our training on our notice boards. And then we also have partnership with municipal libraries. We offer trainings for students who are residing in those municipalities. Uh, different types of training, uh, referencing techniques is part of those trainings that we are offering. So in my conclusion, it is important, the importance of academic in integrity when you when you cite when you reference when you use your literature correctly there's a lot that you can achieve there's academic success respect for intellectual property the integrity and excellence of the of our academic institution you should know by now how unisa has been dragged in all these social media platforms for us to uh, uphold the academic integrity, we need to avoid plagiarism in all as, 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 as I don't know, as we need to avoid it at all so that we can, uh, our academic institution should have a good integrity and excellence. And then you must also uh, use the strategies in your in your academic work. In that way, you demonstrate ethical conduct and you promote academic integrity, etc. That is all, and I thank you. Are the library trainings available at any time from your website? Um, I saw on the example the list of of references that um a page number was not included. Um, is it not necessary? Will I not be penalized if I, I don't include a, a page number on on referencing? And just to maybe take it back, uh, I might have missed it. Uh, how to avoid uh, self plagiarizing? Um, how do I cite or reference my own previous work? And is it all work that I have uh, submitted through UNISA as an assignment for me to uh, what what you call to reference? Thank you. Okay, when you cite your own work, you need to write. Okay, for an instance, if I'm citing my own work, I'm pitching MD. I'm going to cite as 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 it appears as it appears on my. On my, if I'm citing my dissertation, on my dissertation, the way it appears, if the author is PJM MD, I'm going to write it as PJM MD as the author and the title of my, of my, of my, uh, my dissertation and the year where it was when it it was published. When I do the referencing list and when I do the in te uh, in text, that's where I'm going to write my say name, the year when it was published, and the page number, if it appears. I have to cite it as it is. I shouldn't say I. It's Pichang MD. Pichang, uh, uh, according to Pichang, this is what this is what is happening. I need to cite it as it appears on my on my dissertation or on my article. 
and then the all the work that you have published you need to cite them whether you have published or, or whether you have written an article while you are studying at Stellenbosch or while you're studying at UCT you need to cite your work to avoid plagiarism self plagiarism okay and then the other one I asked about the the available dates on the website there's a, a a calendar or a schedule that is already been put there for students to book their training it's not on a day-to-day -day basis that there are dates that are put there because we have three branches each branch is given a chance to do the training and then even on partner libraries remember we require space to use their libraries there so they have given us dates when we should be able to come to conduct our trainings the trainings that are center based you can come on a daily basis to do one on one training i hope i've answered you and then you are not restricted to attend trainings that are in johannesburg when you attend them online if you see on the on the on the calendar, there's various uh, libraries or various regions that advertise their training. If you feel like like Wednesday it's the Johannesburg training and you will not be able to attend the, the one in Johannesburg, there's a training in UCT that is held online. You should be able to connect and attend that training. We're coming to the second last speaker who is going to give us a presentation on a web web based plagiarism detecting software like example Chenitin software <clears throat> and that is going to be presented by Mrs. Erika Flinspech van der Waal van der Waal Good okay. afternoon um colleagues and students and welcome to this presentation Please note that this presentation is from the technical administrative space and it is done as a courtesy to give, provide you with an overview of how the program is applied at UNISA and what it entails. Any findings or academically related questions concerning in this regard would need to be addressed to your respective lecturers or supervisors. Um, just one other quick note i have noted that the all postgraduate students within this session just not not only undergraduate students they all dedicated sessions according to college as well in that regard you can keep your eyes open for um, invites in that respect first and foremost turn it in checks for originality and it was acquired by UNISA to guard against both real and inadvertent plagiarism. And it is utilized in support of the institutional policies, the procedures and the academic integrity approach that is taken within the institution. OK, Turnitin is fully integrated. So this is not something that you need to ask. OK, so it is part of the my UNISA. So whether you log into my modules or if you are going to log into my exams, your assessments or assignments that you are going to <coughs> upload um, would be subjected to turn it in in specific cases. Please note that not all your assignments and examinations would require originality reports. This decision is taken based um, on the content or the expectation of the specific lecturer whether Turnitin would be applied. So if it is applied, then it would run automatically. A warning before I continue. This is a warning to safeguard your work. Every effort is made within the Turnitin space to ensure uh, protection of your authorship and um, your safeguarding of intellectual property. But you need to be wise with your work. Okay, You have to upload your work yourself only within the formal UNISA submission space. In other words, in my models where you would log in with your My Life email um, credentials to upload your work. Do not 
upload your work in duplicate. In other words, do not upload it to multiple spaces. Do not give it to a friend, a colleague, a family member, or please be very careful of those so-called individuals out there that sell you these turn it in services and make you all kinds of promises that they will provide you with a good report. These people are very often paper mills in disguise. They steal your work and then they sell it off to other people and they do compromise your work. You are protected within the UNISA account and within the UNISA space and there would not be any undue conflict. So be very mindful in that regard. So, the only action that is required by you um, as a student is if Turnitin is applied by your lecturer for a specific assignment or assessment, you will get a pop-up notice for the very first time when you upload something that needs a Turnitin report. And it will ask you to accept the Turnitin EULA. The Turnitin EULA stands for End User License Agreement, and that is what we use to protect your authorship and your work. So in this screenshot, this is what you would see on my UNISA if you've uploaded a document and you need to accept the Turnitin EULA. There's an orange button, you click on it. And the moment that you've clicked on I accept the Turnitin EULA, it will give you a little thank you note. So it will say thank you for accepting the latest turn it in end user license agreement. The nice thing about this is it will not ask you repeatedly to complete this. You only need to do this once. So once on my modules, once on my exams, and that is it. Any subsequent submissions that would need turn it in will acknowledge your authorship and it will give you an indication to say thank you, you have already accepted this. Please note that we will not be able to process your work um, because we won't be able to protect it unless you have accepted the turn it in EULA and your lecturers would not be able to mark your submissions. So do be mindful in that regard. Your lecturers would also give you the necessary information on site, meaning within your specific module code of what the requirements are and what file types would be permissible. Okay, so for your file types, the preferred one is the Microsoft Word, the .docx one. There are cases where you are also permitted to upload in Adobe PDF format. So not scanned, you would see that your lecturers who would apply for specific assignments, you're either turn it in, you are required to upload only in typed text form um, your work. Other words, in other words, not handwritten submissions. The turn it in originality reports at UNISA are all inclusive. So please make sure that you do have a title page for every submission. If I say title page, it can just simply be a, a couple of lines at the beginning of your document, just to include your name, your student number, the module code, which assignment number or assessment number you are submitting and the date, because that is like double security in identifying your authorship and will also assist us to protect your work should somebody in future try and plagiarize from your work. Then the bibliography or the reference list where it is applicable, but is also included. And note that that is there and it serves as confirmation of the content with your um, uh, submission and the text. You have had very good speakers um, prior to myself that um, highlighted the referencing techniques that you need to use and how you should paraphrase your work and how you should present your ideas and thoughts within the content. And having your bibliography or a reference list added within that would just simply underscore what you have um, presented. Please be mindful that you upload in the correct space. So double check the module code, double check the assignment number that you are going to submit to because your submissions are stored permanently. And that is also how we protect your work so that other people do not steal your work within the submission. What does Turnitin do? 
Turnit checks for originality. So it will run reports, it will run various checks for the specific submission that is being received. Okay. So it will compare the content of your submission to different repositories. There's one for periodicals, meaning all sorts of publications. There are internet repositories as well as student repositories, which cover national as well as international submissions within the Turnitin space. So it is not limited to Unison submissions. It goes worldwide. Okay. And that generates an originality report finding similarity in the content. Please note that this is not a plagiarism report. I beg of you, do not refer to that as a plagiarism report. That's not what Turnitin does. It does not check plagiarism. It checks for originality in the deliverance of the work and through the analysis of these checks and reports, we are able to identify if plagiarism is present within that specific document and these investigations are done by your lecturer. Turnitin also checks the integrity of the submission to identify the authorship originality and it guards against academic misconduct. Academic misconduct would include intentional action of fraud or cheating, which would also include plagiarism if it is identified within your document. The Turnitin process. After submission, the old document will be queued, okay? Then it will mean my UNISA will see that this needs to go to Turnitin and it will send it to Turnitin. If Turnitin receives this, Turnitin has 24 hours to generate the report. Note that I've added here that you have to allow 48 hours for the UNISA process. The reason being that UNISA needs to receive your submission. It then needs to send it to Turnitin. Turnitin generates the report and my UNISA again collects the report to attach it to your submission because you are privileged at UNISA to see the findings of your similarity and the report. It will be attached to your submission and then it is going to be available to yourself as well as your lecturer or your supervisor. You'd have by default the opportunity to do three submissions for the same assignment. This enables you to do a draft, retrieve an originality report, and then you can rework and consult with your lecturer on the findings of the report, follow the guidelines to revise your work. Then you can go back, you can upload again, and a new report will be generated. Should it be needed to um, work on that submission again, you have a final opportunity before the due date for a third upload. Okay. Then on the due date, all of the reports will be regenerated. So to ensure that we have procedural fairness and that all of the reports are generated at the same time for your lecturer so that they can start marking or assessing your specific submissions. Okay. So you will not see the three chances separately, but they are built in by default. So that means you just simply return to your assignment submission space to upload the revised work that you have. Please note that this is a learning opportunity for you, and it helps you to identify the areas where you might have, for instance, overutilized quotations. Okay or where you might have relied too heavily on one specific source and to learn from that um, um, action. This is not a debugging exercise. It is not intended to um, find ways just to meet a specific um, percentage in this regard. This is the view that you might encounter after you have submitted your document. It will say queued. Okay, this is not an error. Please be patient. Okay. If it says queued, it simply means that my UNISA recognizes that your submission has to go to turn it in. If it says pending, then it is en route um, to turn it in and will come back with a specific report. If your submission is in the queued status, 
please do not try to reload or resubmit your document. It will compromise your queue and will delay the report results from that. So this is correct. It has to say queued. Okay. When it returns from Turnitin, it might either return with a message or it will return with the report itself. Here we have an example of a message where it says report is unavailable. The little blue question mark next to report unavailable, by clicking on that, it will give you a little pop-up note so that you can see why the report was not generated. Report unavailable is not a mistake on the system side. It is a mistake on author side because this document was a scanned document and that is why no report was generated. So please make sure of the file requirements when you have uploaded. However, this provides you then with the opportunity to reload a proper document all before the due date. So please do not postpone in submitting your assignments. You will lose the opportunity to do revisions. Do it well in advance, at least a week or 10 days before the due date, if at all possible. So to allow for sufficient time for the report to generate so that you can have the opportunity to revise the work and discuss with your lecturer before you make the final submission. If the report is returned, you will see that it will be attached to your specific submission with a color-coded block and a percentage. That percentage is called your similarity index, and it is marked with a little blue arrow and page, which is the icon for turn it in, and that will link to your icon. If you view the frequently asked questions list, you will also see that there is a note included there that to open this originality report for you, you need to click on the percentage itself so that it will open in a new tab in your browser. Now for the Turnitin findings, Turnitin identifies non-original content. So everything in the submission which is not original would be identified. And this is going to include copy text from other sources, discipline related terminology that you might use, names and titles, direct quotes, bibliographies, references, citations, templates used, and even AI writing. So that which is not original would be identified by Turnitin. But it doesn't mean that it's necessarily plagiarism. That's why this is not called a plagiarism report. Turnitin checks originality. It does not check plagiarism as such. Because names and titles, for instance, you cannot change those. You need to use them as they are. That is a requirement, especially in your bibliography or for a reference. If you use a direct quote, Okay, a direct quote is already an indication that that is not your own work. It is an acknowledgement of the source of information. So this is all identified and your lecturer then reviews the findings to identify the areas which are of concern or need to be addressed. So please note that your similarity index only shows you how much from the content is not original. It does not say that you plagiarize or not. This is not what Turnitin does. It does not accuse the author or the submission of plagiarism or plagiarized content. It simply identifies the non-original text found within the document itself. Here I have an example of what an originality report can look like. So to the left, when your report is opened, you will see that there are portions of the text highlighted and numbered in different colors. And those align with the source overview on the right-hand side. There would be a column. Again, it would be numbered. And you will see that, for instance, on the left-hand side, and my example, everything highlighted in blue, or marked with a little number one means that it matches source number one 
in my column on the right hand side. Um, I don't have in this snippet an example for number two, but we can see that there is a paragraph number three, which is in purple, and it matches source number three on the right hand side. Okay, so your overall similarity index would be at the top, but that is not where our focus lies. Okay, I realize that the burning question for everybody is always what would be an acceptable similarity index? There is no acceptable similarity index. The reason being that UNISA does not tolerate plagiarism. In other words, it doesn't matter what your similarity index is. If academic misconduct like plagiarism is found within your specific document, it will be unacceptable regardless of what that percentage is. However, we can have a look at the uh, individual sources listed in your column on the right hand side. Now, as you now know that number one in my example here highlighted in blue means that everything in my document highlighted in blue matches number one and it says 26 percent. That means 26 percent from the content of my submission matches source number one. And for these individual matches, we do provide you with a guideline. And that guideline is 5%. In other words, it means that any one of those individual matches need to be less than 5%. So clearly, I have overutilized source number one because it is 26%. So I have to revisit what I have used, how I have acknowledged the work, and if I need to paraphrase more in my own words, or if I should find another source to support my argument, because 26% is too much. We can even see the 23, the 15, my number four that peaks in there is 9%. All of that is too much. Each of them needs to be less than 5%. That is the guideline. And your lecturers are also trained in understanding how these reports are generated and how they should apply the findings to what their expectations were of the specific assignment or assessment that you had to fulfill. So the analysis is always done by the lecturer or the supervisor and to identify the misconduct within the specific submission. Note that it is generally not necessary to rework every single highlighted portion of text because it's not necessarily a problem. Okay. It can also be confirmation of that you've used the proper source, you use names and titles correctly, or that you have given due credit to a specific author, um, for instance, when you did a, a, a direct quote of a specific statement. So there are specific conditions where certain percentages of matching text are allowed, and this will be recognized and acknowledged by your respective um, lecturer or supervisor when they analyze the report findings. So to summarize, the acceptable percentages at UNISA, there is no acceptable percentage for your similarity index. In other words, it doesn't mean if your color coded block is green that it's good or if the block is red that it is bad. It's simply an indication of how much is not original. It is only analysis that would identify if plagiarism is present or any other form of academic misconduct um, uh, was committed within that specific uh, submission. To Make sure that you deliver your original work. That is the idea, not reducing the percentage. If you rework, if you endeavor to present your own original work, obviously your similarity index will decrease and your individual matches will also be lower. Paraphrase, use your own words. Do not paraphrase or use paraphrase text from other persons. Put it into your own words, use your quotes sparingly, and then, of course, if in doubt, you have to cite your sources. And the one guideline that would greatly assist you 
in this um, exercise would be the rule for all of our UNISA students um, that your individual matches need to be less than 5%. That 5% will also accommodate incidental matching like names or titles and subject terminology. So that would accommodate in that regard. Also, if you've cited somebody or if you used a, a, a title or um, in your in your bibliography or your references, this is all covered within that specific guideline. And then lastly, regarding content support, you have to consult your lecturer or your supervisor on the findings of the report of what is expected. If you do not understand, please liaise with your relevant lecturer because they will be in the best position to advise you on what is expected for that specific submission. Okay, consult your prescribed study material as well. Read it, okay, know what it says. The same with the FAQ list that was posted in the chat for your convenience. Okay, read the FAQ list that summarizes the highlights. It actually lists in, uh, I think, 26 or 28 questions, all of the statements that I've made during this presentation. Um, I will also, um, give a copy of this presentation to the program director that they would be able to distribute for you should you wish to refer back to this in the future. And then, of course, a very good presentation that you had from the library on the guidance that they have available there. Um, visit the lip guides and enrich yourself with information regarding research ethics, academic integrity and referencing styles. The more you know, the better you are equipped to bring your own voice forward, because that is what your lecturer is looking for. That's the originality that will build with integrity of your specific um, submission. And that has concluded my presentation for today. Thank you, Thank you very much. Mr. Zulu, your vote of thanks, please. It thank, thanks to all of you who attended this workshop, especially you students. As much this is about you, but it's also important that we come into the platform and show you how we can best support you as a UNISA Gauteng region. Let me also thank all the speakers who participated today and provided enough and adequate information to the students. I hope whatever advice that the students got today, they will utilize it to their best interest. UNISA is a very lonely space, especially since it is a distance education. With us doing these kinds of, uh, of, of workshops, we are trying by all means to make sure that we close the gap between you and UNISA mm -hmm. and your lecturers. We become that conduit for you to be able to pass at the end of the year or become graduate as you continue with your studies. With those few words, thanks again. This uh, workshop is officially over, closed. Hope to see you next time in our next uh, workshops. Thanks again. Thank you. Bye.